Hey folks, Barry here. Today we are going to play Wrath of the Gods. It's part of the End of the World series by Fantasy Flight. This is the second of four of these types of books from Fantasy Flight in that series. There's going to be, there already is the Zombie Apocalypse, which is out, and then the Wrath of Gods here. And then there is the um, Alien Invasion book. Which is not retreat, and I think the last one is the Rise of the Machines. Um, so, an RPG is basically a storytelling game where a one person will be the game master, the GM, and they will create a world where other players will navigate through and change the story as they go along. Um, now, the player count for this is. They suggest that, you know, the GM plus two others or and more. And they don't really suggest less than that, but, you know, it's up to, up to you how many players play. So, without further ado, let's get to the table. We'll explain how this works and how to set it up. And we'll see how Wrath of the Gods works. Okay, folks, here we go with the uh, Wrath of the Gods. It's part of the End of the World series by Fancy Flight. Now, to set up the game, it's a little different for different players. It depends on what kind of player you're going to be. Um, there are GMs, or game masters, and then there are character players. We'll start off with the character players, and then we'll move over to the uh, the game master. Okay, in either case, at least one person will need the rule book for the uh, Wrath of Gods. All right, and it's advised that everybody playing the game should read the rules for Wrath of God, whether you're the GM or just, um, you know, character players. You also need some uh, pen and paper or pencil and paper. Then you'll need some dice. Okay, you'll need two different sets of uh, different color dice or maybe different size dice if they're the same color. Okay, and this will represent your negative and positive dice, and we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. And then you'll also need a character sheet. Now these character sheets can be found on the back page, on the last page of the book, where you can photocopy that and print it off. Or you could go to Fantasy Flight's website, and there they have um, a PDF version of the character sheet that you can print off and hand it out to everybody. Okay, my printer hasn't been used in a while. The uh, color's a little off. Apologize for that, but it'll be good enough for what we're going to use it for. Okay, now once everybody has what they need to begin the game with, um, you're going to create your characters. Okay, if you're the character player, again, we'll get into how the the game master will set up after we go through how to set up a character sheet for the regular players. All right, now if we look at the character sheet we can see we have our name here and we'll fill that in all right now before you actually start filling in your character sheets as a group you're going to decide whether you're going to use a non-fictionalized version of yourself or a fictionalized version of yourself to play the game and it's suggested that you either all play fictionalized versions of yourselves or all play non-fictionalized versions of yourselves okay the uh the, the rule book actually suggests you play non-fictionalized versions of yourself. But if you want to, the options there to play fictionalized versions of yourself. You just, you know, they, they suggest, though, that you don't mix and match. You just, you're either all playing fictionalized versions or non-fictionalized versions. Let's say we have our name. Fill in your name there. And then below the name, there's three categories here. We have physical, mental, and social. Okay, and these represent the different types of tests that you'll be taking throughout the game. And then each category is broken up into different characteristics. Okay, the characteristic on the left is always your offensive characteristic, and the one on the, the right is always your defensive characteristic. And they're measured on a scale from 1 to 5. You will always have a 1 in each category, All right, but it can only go up to a 5. All right, so first we have, under physical, we have dexterity, which represents your uh, your motor skills, your balance, your speed, you know, how quick on your feet you are, stuff like that. Okay, and then we have vitality, which is your strong you are or how tough you are, your uh, your resistance to disease and toxins, how much you can lift, things of that nature. 
For mental, we have logic, which is the offensive uh, characteristic here. And that is uh, the ability to think quickly and uh, your ability to notice your surroundings. Right, this would be something you would use to uh, see if you're walking into an ambush or hacking into a computer system, something to that extent. Then we have willpower, which represents your mental resilience and your uh, your memory. So this would be something you would use if uh, you were trying to recall specific information from years ago or your resistance to the horrors of the world that that will be forthcoming, things of that nature. For social, we have charisma which is your general demeanor and your social skills. Okay, that would uh, govern how easily you can sway others or uh, whether, you, you know, you can be a, a careful negotiation expert. And then we have empathy, which is your ability to understand and sympathize others. Okay, this is something you would use to determine uh, if somebody's lying to you or um, predicting your your adversary's next movement, things to that nature. Okay, so as I said, they range from one to five, and when you're creating your character sheet, you'll each player will be given ten points to use between the six characteristics. Okay, now you always have a one in each characteristic, so that doesn't count. But every other uh, number value will be one more point. Okay, so say, let's say here, physical, I went with a three. I'd circle the three. Since one's always used, that means I only use two points. Okay, so two would be a point, three would be a point. So that's two points. I have eight left to use in the other five categories. Okay, so say vitality, uh, not that strong, I guess. I go with a two. Mental, let's say I'm at a four. Four, and then willpower. Look at me. Yeah, I'm not very big on willpower. Okay, so we use one, two, three, four, five, six, seven points. That means we have three points left to use in social. All right. So say, uh, I think I have more empathy than willpower. So we'll go two and three. Okay, so this is part of the challenge. You only got 10 points to use between these six characteristics. You got to choose wisely what you want to do. And you could go back and forth. You know, it's not that set. You could go back and say, I didn't like that. Erase it and change it to a two or a four later on. It's your call. All right, now once you're done doing that, each player will, you know, show off their character sheets to the rest of the players other than GM. And... They will take a vote on the three categories, okay, on whether they think this this category is accurate for that person or not. All right, so what you will need is a positive and negative die, okay, and you can choose what color of dice is positive and what color dice is negative. That's up to you, okay, but you'll need one of each, one positive, one negative die, and then you'll need a the group as a whole need a bag or a box or something to put these dice into as this vote is kind of secretive all right now like i said for each category you're going to add either one positive die which will say that something in that category should be raised okay you'll add or you'll add one negative die which means that you don't think one of those two characteristics in that category is right one of them needs to be lowered or you will put both of your dice in a bag or box and that'll say that yeah you think this player is okay with the stats that they have written down okay so one by one players will you know secretively as possible will put the number of dice in the bag that they think should happen Okay, pass it on to the next player, and then the next player, and then that, when all that's done, players will empty out the bag. Okay, and let's say it, it goes something like that. All right, so here we have a equal amount of positive and negative dice, which means this player would not change anything in that category. Okay, say instead it was uh, something like this. Okay, we have more positive dice than negative dice, then... The player would raise 
either the dexterity or the vitality in that category up by one point, but you can never go above five. All right, so if, say the dexterity was at five, they couldn't raise that up one. They'd have to use vitality and push that one up. All right, likewise, if it were to reverse, say there was more negative dice than positive dice drawn at the end of the, the voting for that person, then they would have to lower one of these stats, never going below one. Okay, so once that is taken care of, you go on to the next category, and the next category, and then, you know, you continue like that till everybody is done voting on each other's character sheet. All right, then we'll move down to the features. The book suggests you, you write down one positive and one negative feature for each category. So we'd have a positive and negative feature for physical, one for mental, you know, positive and negative for mental, and a positive and negative for social. All right, so let's see here. We'll put a positive and a negative. Okay, so let's see. Physical. What's a positive physical feature I have? Uh, now, this could be things like strong back, uh, able to lift weight, you know, a lot of weight, stuff like that. Negative would be, you know, can't run, can't, can't walk far distances. Um, things to that degree mental you know would be something like uh kind of puzzle out things quick quick thinker um negative would be you know the reverse of that um unable to think on their feet things of that nature so let's see here so a negative is i can't walk long distances Okay, positive. Um, see, I have. Huh, good question. Have you seen me lately? I mean, <laughs> I'm kind of beat up. <laughs> uh, let's see. This is actually kind of tough. <laughs> I'm actually doing one. Um, let's see. Strong legs. I'll put that. I don't know. Okay. All right, mental, let's see. I uh, learned fast. Um, negative. I'm a visual learner, so I, I don't learn well from written. Okay. Um, I can, but it just it takes me longer. So I'll put that... Uh, can't learn from books you know, again I can but it, it just it takes me longer I actually gotta do things myself to figure it out alright social um, I listen well and I do not like crowds alright so but don't I know my handwriting's atrocious like, crowds. He said I should have been a doctor instead of a mechanic. Okay, now, if during the voting um, of your characteristics, you were voted to, um, you know, raise your positive feature in that, or, you know, raise a positive characteristic, you know, move one characteristic up, then you would either add another negative characteristic in this um, specific column, or you would not write down a positive feature. Okay, and the same goes with the negative. If during the vote you got more negative dice than positive and you had a lower one of your stats, then you would either add an additional positive feature or not include a negative feature. Okay, so that's, part, that's basically the, the feature section. Okay, these just represent, you know, your strengths and weaknesses a little more in detail than the number value up top there. Okay, stress. Don't have to worry about that right now. It's used in the games, and we'll get back to that a little later on. And then traumas. Okay, now traumas are, are uh, 
usually negative um, things that you're going through right now. All right, so like if you had a cold, you put that down as a, a trauma or a twisted ankle or something like that. And these things can be healed over time. Now, the book suggests that you don't use something that you're not comfortable with sharing. Okay, so if something really bad happened to you, to you, you wouldn't put that down. You know, like let's say you're going through some domestic disputes or something with, with your spouse. You wouldn't put things like that down. But say something like, you know, you're not feeling too well or, or you're, uh, you know, uh, you're kind of in a depression, but you're open to discuss that a little bit. You know, maybe something like that for the mental or social just say you're you know you're like sick of people you, you just want to you know want to be a little bit of a recluse something to that effect then again these can be healed over time the, the book suggests that you choose up to one in each category so you can but you don't have to for me let's say physically right now i'm not feeling too good a little under the weather so i'll put that as a one week okay i don't think it's something i'll get over with in a day and uh, put under the weather. Okay, now again, these will be a negative in the game. Okay, and then finally we have equipment. Now equipment can be anything around you, anything within reach. Okay, something that you would take on your journey and the end of the world. Okay, and try and be reasonable with this <laughs> you yeah. know all right so it could be things like like the cell phone I, you know everybody has a cell phone these days and uh they suggest you uh you, you get a little specific with this like with how much battery you have left in it so i think last time i seen mine it was like 86 percent. i just charged it last night um i'm not a cell phone whore either so mine will be charged for these okay and this could be a positive or, or a negative depends on on what it is um what else i do have weapons in this house so i probably use that so i have a 12 gauge shotgun And this gets in the weapons, and I'll get a little bit more detail with that a little later on. But let me get the book out, and we'll see what the uh, the stats for that are while we're here. Okay, so weapons are are used in the end of the world, naturally. But some of them can have a negative die because of the uh, the nature of using the, the weapon. All right, so here we have... Uh, do they have a shotgun? Yes, they do. Actually, 12-game Rivington, which isn't what I have. But. All right, so it says added dice and on, then it has damage of a four. And we'll get into that when we get into combat. Okay. Uh, uh, books. I have books. I have, uh, what have I been reading? I've been reading HP Lovecraft lately. Okay, and that uh, that would help me in the mental category. Okay, so we'll say that'll give me plus one die in mental. Okay, uh, I got my wedding ring. Okay. push comes to show i could sell that you know borrow with it so it give me plus one in social okay and, and you continue down the line with things that are around you that you could use now remember you're, you're going to be carrying this stuff so there's no strict uh, weight limit involving with the equipment but as a group you know you should uh say hey you know, you won't be walking around with a duffel bag full of guns or something to that extent. Okay, so that that's basically the character setup for or the character sheet setup for players.
now we'll get into the GM a little bit. Okay, now with the GM, the game's a little different. The, the GM is creating this world. All right, so you can use character sheets to, to make what's called NPCs, non-player characters. Okay, and these are just simply characters that the uh, player characters will be interacting with throughout the game. They work similarly to uh, player characters. The only difference is they're not as in depth. Okay, they they wouldn't have equipment and traumas and stuff like that. It, it would basically be their stats, and then uh, um, you'll use their stresses. Okay, and we'll get into exactly how that works later on. But so you might want to print off a couple of these to make NPCs with different character uh, non-player characters that the characters will interact with. You also want to create your story arc. Now, the book suggests that players start like they're playing a game. You know, they're playing an RPG at the table when all this stuff happens. So, you know, it, you can use that in this playthrough. We won't. We actually, uh, the players will be attending a con, and then we'll go from there. But in the game, like I said, it suggests you start with players starting at a table and, and playing a, a, a game at the table when all this stuff happens. The GM, if you are in the world of the story, you want to try and get yourself out of there as quickly as possible. You know, like you had to run home for an emergency or, or maybe you killed yourself off to bring the brutality of the world to the players as quickly as possible, stuff like that. All right, and then you'll want to make a story arc. Now, the book comes with five different scenarios. Okay, and there's two links for each scenario, basically. We have um, the apocalyptic one, and then we have the post-apocalyptic one. Okay, so we have Guy's Revenge. Okay, and if we look, it says apocalyptic. And then if we go down a few pages, it'll say post-apocalyptic. And these are used for, like, either a one-shot or a continuing campaign. Okay, it'll say post-apocalyptic. All right, and basically what each scenario will do is it'll give you a little backstory of what's going on. You know, some ideas that you can use to create your own backstory of the world. And then it will give you some suggestions of what's going on okay so we'd have a timeline here a suggested timeline to use okay and it goes up to two years in most cases and then they'll give you some examples of different locations to use okay so we have a city here you know it gives you a little background of what's going on in the cities when this stuff goes down it gives you some events and encounters suggestions down here below each one and they do that for different ones so there's a suggestion for an earthquake one for a city you know <clears throat> cyclone tsunami volcano zoo okay and that's for Gaia all right and then in the back they give you some suggestions for NPCs all right so we have the ant swarm and the puppy you know cute little puppy there chewing off of a dude's hand the cows and and, and baboons things of that nature and, and like it'll say it'll just it'll give you basically their their stats and then some features you know like for the flock of birds here say plus one uh flight plus one flock plus one looming so these are all positive dice you would use as an opposition test to to the player characters and then there's some negative ones they're territorial uh wrathful animals that could be either positive or negative um they do have equipment, stolen shiny trinkets, things of that nature. And then uh, it'll give you a little bit more uh, information there. All right. So, like I said, they do this for each of the five scenarios. And then later on, they'll have the uh, post apocalyptic one, which will basically give you a few more suggestions. Um, you know, uh, some more background on what's going on after the apocalypse happened. And then again, it'll give you more locations and a couple more NPCs to use with. And then it, it has four other um, scenarios there. So you'll have to choose which scenario. And this one we're going to be doing the uh, the one for Gaia there. Gaia's Revenge. 
All right, so as a GM, you're going to want to choose which one of the five scenarios you want to use. And then what type of campaign do you want to run? Do you want it to be a one-shot deal, like we're going to do in this video? Or do you want it to be an ongoing campaign that you could do weekly or bi-weekly or, or bi-monthly or however you guys decide to do it? All right, so you're going to draw a, you know, write out your world and, and your... Uh, your locations and you know you may want to do maps and use use like little minis there to represent each player and can use graph paper to draw out a map and each square on them to the graph paper would be like you know five feet or, or whatever you could use that to represent battle situations or or uh you know towns that your your characters are going into or, or things of that nature uh, it's this system isn't real rules heavy, which is one thing I do like, but it it it's not real strict either. Okay, so pretty much whatever you can imagine, you can write down and and map out, and your players can do. All right, so that's going to be the setup for the GM. Uh, you know, figure out your story, write down, create a couple NPCs, a couple locations. You know, uh, try and connect point A to point B if you can. Now remember, players are going to change the story. You know, they're, they're just going to not do what you want them to do or they're going to venture off on their own, you know, in a weird way. So you might want to, you got to prepare for things like that. Maybe do two or three endings instead of just one, depending on how the players reacted and, you know, which way the story turned as you went through it. You know, be prepared for, you know, if you throw an NPC out there, be prepared for them to interact with them or maybe just totally ignore them. All right, so don't get too hung up on all the work that you put in with creating all these NPCs and cool storylines. In the end, it's it's a give and take between the GM and the players, and you're just there to have fun. All right, but enough right about that. Let's get into how the game is actually played. Okay, folks, now in Wrath of Gods, basically what happens is the world's being destroyed by gods. Okay, now in the book, there's five different scenarios. There's Cthulhu, there's uh, the Revenge of Gaia, there's uh, a Viking-themed one, then there's the Mexican Snake God. I can never remember that one's name. And there is one based on the Old Testament. Okay, and depending on which scenario you're playing will depend on which gods are trying to destroy mankind. The one we're doing this week, it's going to be the uh, Revenge of Gaia. So basically what's going on is the Earth is trying to take back what mankind's uh, been slowly killing off from it. All right, So there will be uh, various weather effects that are trying to destroy us. Earthquakes and, and tsunamis and hurricanes and, you know, maybe ice storms and, and things of that nature and the animals will be uh attacking the players you know um, pets dogs and cats will be turning against us wild animals lions and tigers and bears oh my they're all going to be coming after us the plant life itself you know the trees are going to take back the the cities and and uh take back the land that they lost to the development and things of that nature okay now in the game the gm will basically be the storyteller of the game. They will run pretty much every aspect of the game. They will tell players what different encounters are and how to handle them, what tests to take during these encounters and stuff like that. And the players are, in this RPG, just basically trying to survive is what it gets down to. And they will be taking these tests and exploring the world that the GM has created for them. Okay, now, in every game, players will have their player sheet, which is... Their stats, you know, it's a it's a numerical representation of different characteristics they have, whether it be dexterity or vitality for their physical, you know, uh, logic, willpower for their mental, or charisma and empathy for their social. And these stats will dictate the results they need in their dice pools. You know, the dice, when they roll the dice for different tests that the GM will throw at them. All right, so as I said, we will need dice to create a dice pool to take these tests and the book uh, the book suggests that you choose two different types of dice colors okay they're all going to be these sixes but there are there'll be two different colors or maybe two different sizes of the same color if you can't find two different uh 
colors. All right, but they should all be D6s. And throughout the game, the DM will throw us these tests using one of the categories, okay? Or one of the characteristics, I should say, okay? So say, you know, a player's trying to jump from one building to another. So the DM will say, okay, test your dexterity. And we'll look at our dexterity here. And the dexterity is a three. All right, so we'll always have at least one positive die. Okay, and then we'll look down here at our at our features and our equipment to see if we can find anything that will help us out with this. All right, so I have strong legs, I said. Okay, so let's say, yeah, that, that'll give me an extra die. An extra positive die. Okay, um, nothing in my equipment will, will really help me out on this. Feeling kind of ill, so that may give me a negative die. Okay, and then the GM will say, okay... Let's say it's a, it's a good distance. We're going to give another negative die because of the distance. Now, the GM can give up to four negative dice. Okay, and these negative dice represent the hardness of the test, basically. Okay, if there's no negative die, it's something that a player would do at any given day. One negative die, it's a little, little harder than the average thing that they would do. So they give you one negative die, you know. Four negative dice is like something extraordinarily difficult for a player Something that they don't really encounter too much. Okay, so now we created our dice pool. All right, so we have two negative dice. We'll use the purple dice for negative and two positive dice. We'll use the blue ones for positive. So basically what will happen is we will roll these dice. Okay, and we will compare them here. First thing we will do is we will see if any of the negative and positive dice come up with the same results. Okay, none of them did, okay? But say we had a, a four negative die and a four positive die. If that were the case, those two dice would cancel each other out and we'd remove them from the pool. Okay, but that wasn't the case. We had this guy here. All right, so then we would take a look at the positive dice, look at the characteristic we were testing, which in this case was dexterity, which I have as a three, and if it were at a 3 or lower, I would have passed the test. But you can see these guys are at 4. I didn't pass the test. I failed miserably. So we remove them. We're done with them. We no longer need them. Then we take our negative dice. And then for each negative die that we have left, ones that were not canceled out, we would take our pen or pencil and we would go down to the stress and resistance level here. And we mark off one box for each die. This represents, it could represent a different thing. In physical, it might be like an injury or something that occurred when you were trying to pass the test. Whether you passed or failed, you know, say, you know, say if I passed the test, yeah, I jumped across the buildings. But when I, when I landed, I, you know, I, I twist my ankle and fell wrong, you know, on, on landing or something to that effect. Being that I failed the test, you know. Either the GM or myself would explain how I failed miserably. You know, like I was running, running to go jump across the building. I tripped and fell, and before I, I took a leap and and fell on my face. Okay, now if we look at the stresses here, we'll see that there's different tiers. Okay, we got tier one, tier two, and tier three. Throughout the game, we'll be collecting these different stresses. Whenever we fill one tier. And we move on to the next tier. So say we got a fourth stress here and we're up in the tier two. We now have one resistance because one of these tiers will fall. All right. So the next time, let's say we did that same test. Okay. We came up with this result here. And again, my tier was full. And I'm on the next tier there. I built up a resistance of one die. So... With that, I can eliminate one negative die right off the bat. Okay, I don't have to worry about it. And then I continue on with figuring out the results, that, you know, canceling out positive negative dice if they match, and then seeing if I passed or failed the test. Okay, now the stress pool also acts as your life points, basically. So if you ever got nine, life, uh, nine points of stress, you die. But you have the opportunity to do what's called clinging to life. When that occurs, what you will do is transfer these stress points into a trauma. You'd have to take a test of the defensive characteristic in the appropriate category. 
okay? It depends on what the stress level is at, what category the stress level is in. It depends on what defensive ca uh, characteristic you would do that in. So we're going to say it's here. We'll do vitality. We'd roll one die. And I failed, so I die. But if I had passed, say I got a one, I, w I would pass that test. I would cling to life so I could remove two tiers of stress, leaving me with three points of stress. And I could turn the stress that I removed into a trauma at a tier three, because that's where I started off with. So that would translate into a one month trauma. Okay, and then. I'd fill it in. i say, all right, um, you know, I broke my leg. Being it's a physical one, I'd have a one-month trauma with a broken leg. Okay, and then like I said, I'd be left with three points in the level one tier, and I could continue the game. Now, another way we can reduce stress is we'd have to pick a time throughout the game where nothing else is going on, you know, they say like five minutes uh, in game time, um, where I could reflect upon the, the injuries caused by this category. The stress is caused by that. So say we were here in the mental, okay, and we had, uh, let's say we had six points of stress in the mental category. Okay, we could sit there and reflect on, on what happened and turn that into a, a trauma of a tier two which would be a, a one week trauma and we could knock our stress down to nothing okay so that's pretty much stress it's your it's basically your life points now we have traumas also traumas can be healed over time all right so say we we went through uh, a week in time in in our our, our game and as you can see here i haven't been feeling well under the weather it's a one week trauma okay on their physical so i do the same thing i take a test in the vitality our defensive stat and physical for this case and i take a test with it okay i got a one i pass so then i could turn that into a one week or i'm um, sorry a one day trauma and change it to you know uh i got uh, allergies or something all right so I would knock it down to a one day. And then eventually, you know, say at the end of the day, I could test it again and eliminate that trauma altogether. Okay. Now, if we were ever to take four, a fourth trauma in any category. Okay. So, see here, I already have two traumas. Say, at some point I took a third trauma and the other two weren't healed yet. And then I would have to take a fourth one. You would die automatically. You cannot do that clinging to life mechanism like I was mentioning earlier with the uh, stresses. Okay, so after four traumas, you're dead automatically. Okay, so that's basically how stresses work and traumas. Now, throughout the game, when you are doing a test, you could push yourself kind of. Okay, so let's go back to that jumping over two buildings things. Okay, uh... We'll go back to the four dice that we use. When when you say I want to push myself, you can only do this once per round per test. Alright, and what you would do there is you would take an additional positive die and an additional negative die, and then you can push yourself and, and see if you can, you know, get a better result using that. So in this case here, these two fours would cancel each other out. Okay. And then, if I look here at the physical, say we're still at that four points of stress thing, I have a resistance of one that would cancel out another negative die. Then I would look at the results, and I got a one. So we were testing de dexterity to jump over the building. I need a three or lower. I got that, so I passed, but I still have one negative die. I would take one more point of stress. Then you know we'd uh, describe how how my success for jumping over the building occurred. Uh, as you can see, I'm using a pen. I think it'd be better off using a pencil. I just couldn't find one, so that's why I'm doing this in pen. You know, you'll be erasing these these stresses and traumas and, and rewriting them and all. Okay, so that's how basic test will work. You'll create your dice pool, 
Okay, positive dice. You always get one for the the uh, category that you're using it. The um, characteristic that you're using. You always get at least one die. Then you'll look at your features. See if any of them will give you an additional die, either positive or negative. And then your equipment, the same thing. See if any of them give you a positive or negative die. And then you'll look at the traumas. Traumas will always be negative. And then the GM will say, you know, one additional uh, negative die. And you'll roll them, see if anything cancels each other out, look at the results, see if you passed or failed. Now you can also get positive or negative dice depending on the environment. Alright, so say the GM said, uh, you know, you're in a, in a, in a uh, dark cave that's lit only by a torch. And something is coming into the cave, you don't know exactly what it is. Say the player said, well, I want to try and hide. Okay, so the GM said, okay, it's dark in the cave other than around that torch if you you know the, the player said i want to move back into darkness and try to hide being that the cave is dark you know it would block sight for some creatures that would give you an additional positive die okay again they could work negatively too say you were in the same situation in a well lit room that would give you a negative die okay now in the game there's going to be conflict obviously you know there's going to be different NPCs, non-player characters that you're going to interact with, whether it be, you know, a straight-up assault or, um, you know, a social encounter where you're trying to negotiate with this uh, NPC or, you know, maybe a mental encounter where you're trying to figure out how a puzzle works to, to uh, give you information or, you know, how to unlock a combination, things to that extent. Okay, when, when we get in the conflict, the first thing you get that has to be determined is the initiative. Okay, normally when we're taking these tests and, and doing these other things, it's just the, M, the uh, GM saying, okay, take the test, see what happens. When it comes to any type of conflict, the, the game's timing kind of changes where each player and non-player in that conflict will take a turn. All right, the first thing we had to do is set up the initiative of who will go first. The order of initiative is usually left up to the GM, okay? But it could be something such as whoever, you know, if it's a surprise attack, whoever initiated the surprise attack would go first. Or, you know, if, say, you were negotiating with a non-player character and then you attack them, then the players would have the initiative. If there's ever a, a tie of initiative or you know it's just undecided who would take the initiative first then the gm can call for the players to take an up opposed test is what the book calls it but basically what you're going to do is each team will take a dexterity test so the npcs will choose somebody on their side to take a dexterity test and then the players will choose somebody on their side to take a a, a dexterity test basically roll off and whoever won that test would get initiative so in this case we'll say this was the players they passed the test they would take the initiative all right now when you go into these conflicts and and you're in that structure turn where one player will take a turn and then the next player and so on normally there's things called tasks that you're going to resolve okay and there's two different types major and minor tasks the minor tasks are something that doesn't take a lot of your attention to accomplish and it's usually something that's real fast to do less than 10 seconds in gameplay okay so things of this nature would be like ducking uh, pulling out a piece of gear or, or uh, weapons opening or closing doors dropping the a prone position or standing up or speaking to other characters things of that nature major task would be things such as uh like climbing or jumping, um, hiding from an enemy, uh, sprinting, running away more than like twenty meters on your turn uh, in one in one turn is what they say. Uh, coercing an enemy into surrender, talking down an enemy, or attacking an enemy would be a major task. All right, let's talk about attacking because you know eventually you're going to have to attack things in, in this game. Alright, so to attack, you're basically going to do a test like you would do normally, but there's a couple differences. 
Right, so say we have baboons here attacking me. Okay, so I would test dexterity to use a weapon. All right, so I get one die to use that weapon. All right, now if I look down here at the 12 guy shotgun, it does a damage of four, which we'll get into a little bit later, but it does not give me any additional dice. All right, say somewhere along the line, I gain a feature of being a good shot. So that would give me an additional die that I could use. Okay, and then with weapons, there are ranges. Okay, and the book describes in detail a little bit more, but with a shotgun, it's usually about 50 yards, or I think they say it's like 35 meters. Let's say I'm aiming at a baboon, but he's, let's say he's 55 yards out, a little further than the normal range. So the DM may say, okay, we're going to give you a negative die for that. Okay, and then... Uh, let's say I had a scoop on the shotgun, so I get one more additional die for the scoop. Okay, one more positive die for the scoop. So I'd give these guys a roll. Okay, now I would see if I had passed. So I'd look at my dexterity, which is a three. The only one that passed was this one die. None of them canceled himself out, so I don't have to worry about that. So I did successfully hit the baboon. So, I would look down here to the damage the shotgun did, which is four, and I would add up four points of stress onto the physical area of that baboon. All right, but say I got two successes. So, what I would do then is I would have the four damage for the baboon, and I would add it to the number of successes I had. So, here I had two successes plus four. I would get six um damage to the baboon. So I go over and fill in six points of stress for the baboon. Now this only occurs if you passed. If I had failed the test completely then obviously I missed nothing would happen. Alright then the baboon would go. Alright so that's pretty much how combat goes. You look at the weapons you're using. Okay you need to pass at least one to use it. Testing your dexterity and then you add up the damage. Give it to the uh, opposing force. Once it has filled up their stress in that particular category, it has died. All right, I did this wrong in the uh, video coming up for the first round. I, I, for some reason, we were we actually fought a baboon, and for some reason, I was, thought it was a vitality, but it's not. It's the number of stresses. You know, nine stresses will kill it. I'll fix that the second time around. But just in the video, I, I kind of screwed that one up. Okay, now these attacks may not necessarily be physical. They could be mental or social, too. Um, you know, it could be a case of a, a an NPC ta uh, tormenting you, you know. Uh, so that might be mental, or it could be that they're taunting you constantly, and that could be social, you know, stuff like that. So don't just limit yourself to thinking attacks could be physical. Okay, so that's basically the rule set now before we go let's talk a little bit about the gm side of it, of the things okay the uh, first thing is when it comes to rules the gm will always be the decider of the final rules okay whether it be how many negative dice are given or whether a player can or cannot do a certain thing that they want to do now a gm should structure their their game where players have a goal that they're trying to set. Now that being said, the GM should not stick to their guns on this goal to the point where players will lose interest and not have as much fun in the game. Okay? After all, this is it's a game where people are supposed to have fun. The book has many suggestions on how, how to run it. You know, where it talks about exploration and the social aspects of the game and then um, downtime, you know, it tells you how maybe you should use the downtime to, you know, help the, the players treat their traumas and, and things of that nature. You know, it's, the story is basically going to be a roller coaster going up and down between the struggles and the intense moments that that will be revealed to the players throughout the game. Then it talks about the narrative. It tells us how, you know, each scenario gives you some background information on how that scenario began. So, you know, maybe you relay this to the, the players through 
through the beginning of the campaign, whether it be little scenes, you know, of like with with uh, Revenge of Gaia. Maybe it's it's uh, you know, there's a scene where a plant wraps itself around the building, you know, overnight or, or things to that extent. Okay, and then it, it talks about setting goals where you should, you know, it gives you a couple suggestions for setting goals, like finding food and medicine or acquiring weapons, establishing a safe place, uh, finding long-term safety, because that's basically what this campaign, this these campaigns are set on, is survival. Okay, so just go along with it. Make up the story that you want to tell, you know, but... Again, this is a game, it's an experience shared by the game master and the players. And the idea, the ideal thing here is to have fun. All right? Don't try to kill off all of your players <laughs> if you're the GM. And, you know, if, you, if you're the players, don't try to shift the campaign to the way you want it, where it detracts from the rest of the players or, or the GM, you know? It's a give and take between players and the GM and players and the players you know it's 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 a cooperation so just have fun with it so that's how you play the end of the world wrath of gods